Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Maws. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the Association of Jewish Refugees or AJR. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this very special launch of the UK Holocaust map. Um, just to say a few housekeeping details at first, our, um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we are recording this event um, for our YouTube channel. If you know anyone who uh, wasn't able to join us today, please um, assure them that we will eventually have it up online. They can they can watch it later. Um, we have everyone uh, muted just to prevent any background noise coming on during the presentations. Um, we do, however, hope to have time towards the end for questions and answers. The best way to um, to pose a question to us is to put it in the chat box directed to me, Alex Maws, um, and that way we can, um, when we do have time, I'll direct it to the appropriate person. Um, just to say very briefly a little bit about the Association of Jewish Refugees, many of you will know us primarily as an organization uh, that has a range of social welfare, welfare services and programs for survivors and refugees of Nazism. Um, increasingly, uh, our work, our uh, chief executive, Michael Newman, who is with us here today, just told us the other day that um, last week marked the the um, the first time that our membership has now tipped ever so slightly, where we now have more second and third and maybe even a few fourth generation members as compared to first generation refugees and survivors. So that is becoming an increasing focus of our work, providing programs and offerings for people of the next generations. One of the things that um, our members benefit from in addition to our range of social welfare services is um, our monthly journal, AJR journal. If you know of anyone who uh, would like to become a member or a friend of the AJR and to have this um, journal arrive each month, please do get in touch with us through our website, which is ajr.org.uk. Um, another element of our work is, um, is our educational program. Mostly what this involves is, um, is offering educational grants or grants for educational programs, educational and remembrance programs that focus on, on the Holocaust, teaching and learning about the Holocaust and commemorating the Holocaust. Um, but we have a range of other resources that we've created as well. Some of you will be familiar with uh, the Refugee Voices Testimony Archive. Um, which we will maybe see some examples of today, our My Story book project, our, our Kinder Transport podcast series, and now our latest uh, resource, which we have produced ourselves, which is the UK Holocaust map. I want to tell you a little bit about the background of how this map came to be and what it aims to do. And then I will stop talking myself and turn over to um, a range of different guests who we have today who will uh, talk about the map from a different perspectives and show you some examples of what it can do. I guess the first rationale of this map um, goes back to something that I've been involved in for many years and been a proponent of, an advocate of for many years, which is site-based education. Um, I see on the, you know, on the screen here, many uh, colleagues, people I've worked with in various capacities over the year who, who probably feel the same way, having uh, been on a training course or taken students uh, to various different Holocaust sites or sites of memory. And those who have done that probably will have experienced the um, amazing educational potential that comes when you take young people out of the comfort zone of their classroom um, and take them someplace. Maybe you have a, a, a conversation about the Holocaust, about its moral complexities and nuances that's somewhat similar to one that you would have had back in the classroom, but there's something particularly eye-opening when you're standing at a site, as I said, out of, out of their comfort zone, um, having a, a you know, eye-opening uh, experience and they come away from it with that feeling of I was there, I saw something, I experienced something. This is something that uh, I know Mike Levy, a historian who some of you will know, many of you will definitely have um, met before and you'll certainly know him after this, uh, this event today, have talked about for a long time because we've worked on site-based education for many years together. And it was probably, I don't know, uh, five years ago or so that Mike and I started talking about an idea that he had 
of coming up with some sort of a publication, maybe a book of Holocaust sites, not the, not the ones that most people are familiar with abroad in Poland and Hungary and Germany and France and places like that where the Holocaust, you know, in Nazi occupied countries and the countries where there were death camps and concentration camps and ghettos and mass shootings, things like that, but right here in the UK because Mike and I were talking about how there is actually a lot of Holocaust history right here on our own doorstep. As that conversation evolved, we, we started thinking about other possibilities. Maybe a book wasn't the best way to, to communicate that information. Maybe it should be online, because that's certainly the way a lot of educational resources are going these days. And maybe it shouldn't just be a sort of one-way transmission of information. You know, we're the experts. We're here to tell you, here's what all the sites are that you need to know about. But something a bit more crowdsourced, where we invite the, the, the learners, the teachers, the people who are interested in history and commemoration to be part of this process of identifying local sites of memory and putting them on the map. So that was the first rationale. It's just this... Um, this real enthusiasm for the potential of site-based education. But then the second rationale is another thing that I've cared a lot about in my work as a Holocaust educator for a long time, which is about challenging misconceptions and problematic narratives. One of the most common misconceptions or misperceptions and one of the most problematic narratives, I think, in, in the UK educational context is the idea that the Holocaust is somehow not our history. This is someone else's history. It happened over there. Um, and therefore, we don't really relate to it um, on the same level. And uh, that was something that I felt like this project could really help to counter. And this is something that I think uh, maybe Lord Pickles might be able to comment on um, in a few minutes when we hear from him. Jenny Carson from the Holocaust Educational Trust, who we'll hear from, might want to comment on this as well. Before I turn it over to, um, to the speakers, I want to first of all just say um, a very big thank you to our partner in developing and launching this, uh, this project, which is the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities there, I said it right, I think, um, DLUC. And uh, who is who have been backing this project from when we first proposed it to them and are co-funding it. And I also want to thank um, our partners at QMAP, the digital agency, which developed the amazing um, software, the platform on which this um, this resource sits. I'm going to just briefly show you a little tour of what uh, the map looks like. Um, sharing my screen here. Just bear with me for a second. Um, you'll see that first you, um, you arrive on a basic landing page. Uh, there's a few different ways in which you could uh, explore the map. You could scroll down here. It says begin your search. And you could type in something like, I don't know, Channel Islands. And what would come up is a range of different records and collections that relate to the Channel Islands. These are individual records here. It says in the left-hand corner of each one. And then this one here, the Frank Falla archive. This was curated by Dr. Jilly Carr uh, at Oxford University, uh, Cambridge University, excuse me, and um, uh, relates to a really unique archive uh, that relates to the Channel Islands. So that's one way that you could begin your search is if you knew something in particular that you wanted to look for. You could also scroll down a little further here. We've given you a little bit of inspiration. Maybe there are some themes that you're interested in. So you say, I'm interested in rescuers or refugee committees, internment camps, hostels. Um, we'll, we'll continue to up the, update those as we get more and more content. Um, you could also click through, um, sorry, I should have showed you how to do that. Up in the top right-hand corner here, it says explore the map. And that takes you onto the main page of the map. You see that we've given a few uh, sort of weekly featured records, just a few places that you might be inspired to learn about that you hadn't thought about. Uh, Alex, you seem to have gone on to mute. How about that? That's Whatever. fine. <laughs> How much did you miss? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just saying that uh, you, you know, you could explore by these featured records that we highlight here, 
You could also look at uh, collections that have been curated by our partner organizations. So for example, here we have some records from the Scottish Jewish Archive Center um, from the, uh, from, we're gonna hear from the Wiener Holocaust Library. I just showed you the Frank Fella archive. We've got the Anne Frank Trust, Jewish History Association of South Wales, various different organizations that have given content over to this map that they have curated. So that's another way that you could, you could explore the, uh, the map. Or the most obvious way, I suppose, is just to look at the map um, and to find an area of interest to you, maybe something close to where you live, click on one of the pins and um, see what comes up and uh, learn something about a site that is possibly close to where you live or a place that you visit um, that maybe you, you didn't previously know about. So lots of different ways to explore the map. Um, I appreciate that now having shown this to you and those of you with good um, reading vision will see that the uh, URL is right there for all to see. It's ukholocaustmap.org. UK. Now, you could spend the rest of your time on this, this presentation just off on your own exploring and clicking around and seeing what there is to see, but I actually think um, if you can wait 40 minutes or so before you, you go off on your own, you might uh, benefit from hearing our speakers who are going to give you a little bit of a more personalized guided tour of some of the really interesting content that's on the, on the map. The people we're going to hear from are Mike Levy, the historian um, who was behind a lot of the content on this map who I mentioned before, Lord Pickles, the, um, the uh, UK Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues and uh, co-chair of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation, Jenny Carson from the Holocaust Educational Trust, Alison Ooston from Harlaw Academy in Aberdeen, uh, Toby Simpson from the Wiener Holocaust Library, and Hannah Randall from the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. So we've got an amazing group of people to talk about the map, some of its content, and what we can do with it. So I'm going to ask first um, for Mike Levy to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the sites that he helped to discover or uh, write about and put that content onto the map. So Mike, over to, to you. Great, thank you, Alex. Can you all see me, hear me, and everything else me? Yes, I think you can. I assume you can. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So I'm Mike Levy. I'm one half of a little organization based here in Cambridge uh, called the um, keystage.org. And we, we run history and schools projects, community projects where there's a history theme. I've been doing that for 10 or 15 years now. Uh, when I started doing some of the research for this, having uh, spoken to Alex initially and got lots of ideas about it, I had no idea about the sheer scale of the task ahead. And although this is the official launch, I think this is really just the beginning of uh, hopefully, as uh, Alex quite rightly said, a sort of crowdfunded uh, continuation of the of the map. Um, it, it certainly struck me as being incredibly um, surprising that there were so many venues, so many locations around the UK that had some relationship to the Holocaust. And when we talk about the Holocaust, actually, um, Alex and I talked very originally about how we framed that period. And we decided to frame it really from 1933 onwards, from the first arrivals of Jewish refugees into the UK. Although we're not really talking there about the Holocaust as we know it, it's the beginning, I guess, of what some historians call the Holocaust era. And so we take that right the way through to 1945, even 1946 uh, and, and beyond. So it's kind of the impact of the growth of the growth of uh, Hitler and the Nazis and the spread of Nazi uh, rule over the whole of Europe and what impact that had on the UK. So uh, it's where to start. I mean, there are just hundreds of different locations, but I'm going to start by showing you one of my favourite locations, Dovercourt Bay Holiday Camp. This is down on the Essex coast. It's a particular favourite place of mine because some of you may know I've been involved in the um, planning for a new kinder transport memorial right on the quayside in Harwich. But that's a different story. And I'm sure we'll come back to that later in 2022. But just along the coast, as you can see from Harwich, was the little township of Dovercourt. 
and there a in the winter of 1938 the first arrivals of the kinder transporty children came because frankly they had nowhere else to go it, it was three weeks after Kristallnacht and there hadn't been any kind of time to uh, find foster homes for these children so they were uh, put up they were they were housed in a holiday camp which was closed for the winter it was Warner's holiday camp at Dover Court Bay some of you may be old enough even to remember Warner's holiday camps this uh, was one at Dover Court Bay and in fact later became quite famous or maybe infamous infamous as the location for the series Heidi High there's a bizarre link which I think we mention in the on the map. So if we just scroll down uh, on the text side, Alex, um, uh, you can see we've got a lot of background information there about, about the camp, some of the stories. And um, we've also got um, some film clips for people to look at, which I think really helped to bring the holiday camp alive. There's the, on the, the left-hand side, the black and white uh, still there is from the 1938, um, newsreel taken by um, newsreel cameras as the first arrivals came off the ship. As you can see there, uh, some of the children, the older girls, being met by the policeman who famously smiled at them rather than snarled or shouted orders. And this was their first taste of life in, in Britain. And if we just go back to the uh, gallery of clips, Alex, please. Um, just go back a stage. There we go. We've also got interviews there with Leslie Brent, who was a um, one of the he arrived on that first ship from uh, from uh, Hulk of Holland, and he gives us some testimony for the AJR Refugee Voices um, uh, project, which Alex mentioned earlier, talking about his time at Dover Court. And then uh, on the bottom of the of the uh, collection uh, of clips, a man called David Hughes. This is someone that I interviewed just before, well, a few years before he died. He died at the age of 101. But when he was in only 96, he gave me this interview because David was a volunteer at the Dover Court camp. He was a Quaker volunteer who'd come as an 18 year old to help run the post office at this uh, very important transit camp for Jewish refugees. So that is one of my particular favorite places. And I think it's probably the first location that I pinned or my colleague Leslie Ford pinned on the map. So that's uh, Dover Court. Let's have a look at another one, the Cook Sisters. Um, what I think is really exciting about doing the research for this map is we can come at the UK's involvement in all sorts of different ways, from locations of uh, transit camps, from locations of hostels, and also looking at particular individuals who made their mark. And in particular, you probably all know that uh, the British government decided a few years ago to honour uh, people that um, awarded with a medal called the a posthumous medal called uh, British Heroes of the Holocaust and Ida Cook and Louise Cook were, were, were um, British heroes and we managed to pin I think all of the recipients of the Heroes of the Holocaust somewhere on the UK map. Uh, there, theirs is a remarkable story linked to both rescue of Jewish refugees uh, from Germany and the publication of Mills and Boone uh, novellas. So again, there's this strange combination of history clashing together. And thirdly, perhaps just one that um, I only came across a couple of weeks ago myself, uh, the um, a Culloden House near Inverness, it's, which is now a, a quite a posh hotel, but in the 1930s was a kind of country house um, owned by um, uh, Major Greaves and his wife, Lady Dysart, and they decided to um, donate the house for Czech refugees fleeing the advance of the German uh, armies into, into Bohemia and Moravia. And uh, many of the refugees who came uh, were Jewish refugees. And this is, they came into Scotland, they got a train from Edinburgh, and they stayed for several weeks and months in uh, Culloden House. Uh, now this is so new that not even the people in Culloden House know that this was part of their history, but that's something we will rectify as we develop the, the project. But I just wanted to show that the, the Holocaust had impacts throughout the whole of the UK. Let's go on to the next one, Alex, if we may, which is the, um, 
uh, a company called OP Chocolate Limited. OP Chocolate was one of several dozen uh, businesses owned and run by Jewish emigre business people who came as refugees from Germany. And they were, in fact, encouraged to come to the UK as part of a kind of special development act uh, encouragement of uh, employment in areas of very high unemployment like South Wales. And this was a chocolate factory, um, one of many, many different factories in the uh, Swansea area. Um, and this one was, was, as you can see, founded by v Viennese refugees who set up the factory and, and employed local people. And it's we've, we've tried to, well, I'm really thanking here a researcher called Tiffany Beeb, an uh, American uh, researcher who has located, I think, literally dozens, if not hundreds, of Jewish refugee businesses located in the UK. So it's a very rich pattern. And I, I get the feeling, as, as someone that's been doing research on this, that in a sense, we're only just scratching the surface. Because if we think about it, there were 70,000 Jewish refugees came to the UK between 33 and um, 40 and 39, certainly, and some after the war as well. And of those 70,000, each one came with a story and came with a location and all that's still to be discovered. So it's a vast landscape, which I hope we've just begun to, to, to present to you and hopefully providing some exciting new research as well. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much and um, and just huge congratulations because you've put so much work into the research behind this that it's it's great to finally be here with you in particular, getting to finally show it to the world. So thank you. Um, I now want to invite Lord Pickles to, to share a few words and thoughts of his. Um, Lord Pickles, you are, you know, the the nation's specialist and expert in, in national commemorations. And I'm just curious if you could share some thoughts about where this fits into the bigger picture. Well, it does fit into the bigger picture. And my congratulations, that was absolutely fascinating. I know exactly what I should be doing in the next hour or so. And it's, it is going, it's going through this uh, map. And, uh, but before I go on to where it fits in, I just want to say thank you to the, um, uh, to the AGR sort of 80 years on and still thriving, um, providing obvious care uh, that, that, that you have, but also you, the association is a really big player so far as uh, Holocaust uh, remembrance and Holocaust education is concerned. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why the government, it, just, it keeps changing the name of the department. I think probably the name changed a couple of times while the grant was uh, uh, was being negotiated. Um, we're pleased to be a partner uh, of this because it's part of the wider commitment uh, put forward by the uh, Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission uh, to widen uh, and understand the Holocaust, not just uh, in central London. And the map plays an important uh, companion to physical memorials. Obviously, uh, we see it very much as a partner of the uh, Westminster Holocaust Memorial and Learning Center, which will be an important uh, national uh, symbol uh, due to be opened up uh, in uh, January uh, 2025. But the map extends the concept of memorials to towns and villages right across the country. And it's particularly heartening to see many institutions and archives from across uh, the sector already contributing to the Holocaust map. So, you know, our friends from the, uh, uh, from the Vienna Library, uh, the Scottish uh, Jewish Archive Centre, the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association, Huddersfield, lots of other organisations, uh, too numerous to mention, uh, are all getting themselves very much involved in this. I mean, I think the key message of the UK Holocaust Foundation is that the emphasis on the complexity of histories, including the less well, what's, what, what's a nice word of this? The less redemptive parts uh, will be on this map. So we'll see examples from across the spectrum, places associated with rescuers, with victims, and uh, and with perpetrators. We can learn about those moral grey areas, uh, like uh, British internment camps and places where the kinder tramp uh, uh, children lived, uh, and uh, many of them were very happy, but as we know, some were very unhappy uh, conditions. 
It's also important that we, you, uh, you and indeed Mike Shoulders, the, the Channel Islands, you know, there's a, a kind of a smug uh, feeling within Britain uh, that uh, the kind of roundups and deportations that we saw in continental Europe could not happen on British shores. But here is a, we need to face the fact that they did happen uh, in, um, in British uh, soil. So you have the ability to zoom in and look and see what um, is um, what happened right across the country. But it's important to stress that the historic memory is not something that can be imposed from uh, top down. And I think this is one of the best things about the map, which uh, is a work in progress. And it's uh, an encouragement to uh, people uh, concerned about the Holocaust, to, to, to teach people that might themselves, um, themselves or private archives to get themselves um, involved. And it's part of a, a, a richer tapestry that we're putting together to ensure that, that memory uh, continues and uh, that we remember the, uh, the good folks that founded uh, the association 80 years ago and to ensure that their work uh, is remembered. So I'm actually quite enthusiastic uh, uh, about this and uh, I'm looking forward to what everybody else has got to say, but I can't wait for the ceremony to end so I can get down to some serious clicking. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lord Pickles. Um, you, one of the things that you that you pointed out, I think, is a very good transition into um, our, our next speaker. You talked about the all the different organizations contributing to this. Now, some organizations, um, can, as you mentioned, contributed content to the map um, from their archives um, and things like that. And it's a priority of the AJR in terms of our own educational mission to really just encourage partnerships across the sector. And so one other partnership in, in terms of the early stages of this map is with the Holocaust Educational Trust. Now, HET doesn't ha have an archive like say the Wiener Library, but they're obviously an educational organization. And so I've asked Jenny Carson, education officer at the trust to say a few words about their plans for using this in an educational capacity for training teachers. So Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Alex. So as Alex has just said, I work at the Holocaust Educational Trust as an education officer. I actually work in teacher training. So that's my focus. Ordinarily, this involves uh, organizing teacher study visits and I take teachers over there to mainland Europe and not generally uh, within the UK. So this is you know, helping us fulfill a new exciting mission. So why do we do this? Well, education outside of the classroom, and in fact, as Alex started to say at the beginning, it has the potential to create a different world for our students, opening their minds to things previously read, but possibly not fully considered. So standing at extant or in situ at extant or, or former sites focuses our attention on our, the UK's connection to its Holocaust era history and the larger significance of the Holocaust and its contemporary relevance. Now, as educators, again, something that others have highlighted here, as educators, we know, and as reminded by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's recommendations, we should avoid repeated references to the six million that attempts to envision the enormity of numbers can depersonalize and dehumanize. Yet often, when we teach about refugees arriving in Britain, we reference the approximately 70,000 Jewish refugees who settled before the outbreak of the Second World War, or the almost 10,000 unaccompanied, mainly Jewish children who came on the kinder transport. As if those numbers are any easier for our year six, year nine or year 12 students to envision or to comprehend. So projects like the map help us in our task to focus on individual stories. But to me, I think this project enables something much more profound. So not that long ago, in partnership with the Jewish Country House Project at the University of Oxford, we took a group of teachers to Nyman's in West Sussex. So Alex, if I can ask you to bring up the map so we can tell a story. Brilliant, so Nyman's is our, our red dot in the middle. So Nyman's is home to the Messels family whose efforts family members in Germany to escape to Britain just before the outbreak of the war. So as teachers, what if we stand in this site and think about what's happening just within 10 miles of us? 
the refugee children who stayed at Wyverley Ladies Convalescent Home at Burgess Hill. So that's the dots where you can see over Burgess Hill. Alex, if you can click on that one at the bottom. Okay, and as this is an evolving site, some of these I've yet to send to Alex. All those at Bankston House at Crawley Downs, so at the top, just outside of Crawley, not there yet, um, but this should be on the map at some point. So just outside of Crawley, there's another um, hostel where children or children stayed. Uh, or the council school at Hassock, so right at the bottom of the map, just under Burgess Hill. We need to add another dot there at some point when I've got some more information. But on Saturday mornings in 1939, this council school in Hassock is turned into a synagogue for Jewish children from London. And less than seven miles away from Nyman's at Horsham, there stood Edda Farm, a, a Habonim Agricultural Training Centre. So we're at a site with teachers, we're at Nyman's, we're talking about one family's history, but we're thinking about more than a hundred individuals who shared this 10 mile radius. And in studying these individuals where such testimonies are known, we're breaking down the category of the refugees. We're thinking about individuals, about national, about religious or non-religious identities, political or apolitical affiliations, differences between community groups existing in close proximity. And we can think about points of connectivity. Where might they have met? What might the conversations have been? And we can then take our story even wider to think about the foster families who took in individual refugee children. So we know from his correspondence that German Jewish refugee Ernest Dieter Ball lived in Horsham. So just up just to the left on, on your map. Um, we know he lived in Horsham between 1939 and 1941. And this morning I was looking through the Intergovernmental Committee archives um, and in March 1939, there's a letter from a Mrs. Harvey at Hartfield in Sussex offering hospitality for a Jewish family from Vienna. And then we have on top of this profound work undertaken by local refugee committees who were essential in ensuring housing and support for refugees. Post-war, so one more dot on our map and that's the one on the top right, Alex. So post-war, we can add to this local story that of Bulldogs Bank in West Hoveley, where six young child survivors were housed from October of 1945. So we have all of this history, under-recognised and understudied stories of Anglo-Jewish humanitarianism, refugee self-assistance, sites highlighting the necessity of collective action in the financing, care, support and housing of refugees, and we're only 10 miles from where we started. This map as it develops will allow us to replicate this work with teachers across the country, which is for me a really exciting prospect, as you can probably tell. I am really, I've been looking through the map all morning and I'm really excited. So we're currently planning to undertake similar discussions with teachers in Glasgow as part of a walking tour and teacher study seminar we're hoping to hold in February of 2022 in partnership with Vision School Scotland and with the Scottish Jewish Archives, who I can see are also on the call with us. So thanks again for the invitation to speak. Alex, Mike, AJR, uh, congratulations. It's a really exciting project. I can't wait to see how it develops. I can't wait to help it develop. And I can't wait to get this into the hands of teachers. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I also can't wait to get it into the hands of teachers. One of the, the sort of visions that we have for this project is that there will be schools all across the country who will either go on the map and learn about a site that is local to them that uh, that they've discovered through this map and maybe, you know, walk a you know, a few hundred meters down the road someday and, and do exactly what you're describing, stand there and have that conversation. Um, and similarly, maybe there will be teachers and their students who will undertake some research, do look into local archives and um, learn about things that aren't on this map, but belong on this map. Um, and that is exactly uh, how I came to know our next speaker, Alison Ustin from um, Harlaw Academy in Aberdeen, Scotland. And Alison, I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit about a local site that you did some research and learned about um, and you wanted to incorporate into your, your school's Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration. And so you brought it to my attention. And so now it's on the map. Um, Alison, tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, it's, it's one of the few good things about COVID is that I've been able to attend 
seminars and courses that I wouldn't normally be able to being stuck up in Aberdeen. So I was very lucky in February to attend a session by Mike on the Kinder Transport and he was telling us, go out, do your research, you will find it. And I was going, no, no, I'm in Aberdeen. There's, there's nothing here. In the break, off I went on the internet. All I did was Kinder Transport Aberdeen and there it was, there she was. I discovered this wonderful woman, Erica Shula Freibeck, who had been in Aberdeen on the Kinder Transport. And I came across this article that she had been interviewed for and this photo that you will see here of her standing on the steps of the convent. And I just couldn't believe it because I don't know if MD knows Aberdeen, it's very famous for the granite building, especially the West End. And I, I looked at this door, I thought this could be my school. And the more I read, I discovered she had attended the Sacred Heart Convent School boarding school, which is like literally maybe three minutes walk from the school I teach in. And our, the buildings are very similar too. So when I saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, this is just gonna be fantastic for our pupils. We can walk along the road and stay there. It's, it is now a, a school as well. So I just discovered more and more about her. In that break, I kind of did a mad research online and I found her children and I contacted them on Facebook, the joys of the internet. And by the end of the day, you know, I contacted Mike and I said, I think I found somebody. I says, I think I found the, you know, their children. By the end, I think the next day I got a reply back. And this has started this amazing contact with her family, sadly, Erica was in poor health at the time and she died in August, sadly. But we've got this contact and back and forth with information, I discovered that she had donated a lot of the material that she'd kept, the letters and actually the suitcase that she'd come over with had been, she'd donated it to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I was able to get copies of a lot of the material that I'll be able to use with class, which are just fantastic. And I also got her book. So it was just so much to get. And it's just thrilling. The stories will just bring the Holocaust and the kinder trans to, to life for our pupils. Her memories of living in Aberdeen, just the smallest little details of, you know, hating the porridge, the weather, going into little places and holiday, just the local flavor. And it will hopefully make everything wonderful. And we've got the, I couldn't decide what to do. I had spent so long researching it. And the Scottish government had got the Scottish Library Improvement Fund. And their focus this year was on anti-racism. So I thought, well, this is perfect. The kinder transport is, you know, the, trying to show the beacon of life, developing empathy for our pupils. So I put in a bid to develop this project and thankfully we've got it. So we're going to be starting in the new year, looking at her, the legacy of the kinder transport and thinking about the refugees in the world today and how we treat refugees and the language we use. So hopefully that'll be something very exciting, but I think it was so easy and maybe it'll inspire other teachers to have a go and see what they can discover. But thank you to Mike. I should have listened to him straight away. Absolutely. Thank you, Alison. And yes, thank you to Mike, the, the man of, of the hour who uh, who inspires so much of this kind of work. It's great. And, it, and it's really, it's just really fantastic what you've discovered in your local area and, and how that will help to just, you know, inspire your own students. In Aberdeen. I just wanted to say that I, I, I mentioned in the chat here that um, if people have questions, we do hope to have a few minutes at the end where I could, I could answer. Um, we have one person with us, Jackie Young, who, Jenny, before you were speaking earlier, before you got to the, the, the part about um, Bulldog Bank, uh, Jackie said, will you be talking about the young ones that came to a place called Bulldog Bank? And, and I didn't, didn't have a moment to reply, and then you came on to it. And then as we we're showing this photo, let's see if I can... Uh, pull it back up here. Um, Jackie, who's with us, says, that's me in the front of the photo. <laughs> so what an amazing uh, small world it is, but also, you know, that this, um, 
you know, this resource, is, you know, it, it emphasizes so much. While it's about um, places, so many of these places, what is unique about them are the human stories behind those places. And that just highlights that, that, very, that very point. Anyway, if you have other questions or comments, please do drop them in the chat box directed to, to me, Alex Moz. Um, I want to now um, invite uh, a few representatives, two representatives from our partner organizations. I mentioned um, here that we've highlighted a few of them, uh, different organizations that have contributed some of the content. Now, I'll just, bef before I, um, I turn it over to Toby Simpson, uh, director of the Wiener Library, the Wiener Holocaust Library, I do want to say, because I know we have um, representatives from a number of different organizations across the sector on this call today. And this is, um, as we keep saying, this is really just the start of this map project. We've sort of seeded the map with a you know, a few bits of content. We've got 400 pins so far, but there could be many more than that. And so we would love to have organizations contributing content from their own archives, um, from their own resources to this. If you are not yet uh, one of the organizations that's here on the on the map, that's um, only because we, we haven't had a chance to, to pitch it to you yet, but we'd very much like to have that conversation and, and welcome your content. So please let's uh, let's get in touch. Now the Wiener Holocaust Library is a um, is a great example. Um, here we can see some of the the content that they've put on the map so far. Much of this um, comes from their own uh, map project called the um, the uh, Refugee Map. Toby, if you're with us, do you want to say a few words about what you've contributed to the map? Alex, you'll have to unmute Toby. Oh, uh, yeah, he did him. warn me about that. I'm very yes. sorry um, because I am the uh, I'm the host and we did not yet. Let's see, Toby, there you are. I've asked you to unmute. Hopefully you can. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you. You are, yes, thank you. This has just been a fascinating event to listen to so far. And I, I was just really still thinking about uh, Alison's presentation and what you were saying, Alex, about bringing together people and, and places. I, the thing I find amazing about these resources is the connections. And what the library does as an institution, of course, is it, it does bring people together. And uh, there's a lot of amazing uh, resources here that are deeply linked to many of the places that, that feature on the refugee map. But we're also an organization that gathers things together, books, photographs, uh, posters, and, and actually one of the wonderful things about the UK Holocaust map and the map that we created to map refugee journeys is, is they're just amazing photographs uh, and, uh, uh, and also video clips and, and it, there's such a richness to these resources. And as you say, Alex, it's just the beginning. We couldn't be more excited about what's what's coming next. I think there's huge potential for these resources. I just want to also congratulate you and Mike. Uh, I know from recent experience just how much work goes into these projects. And I think you've done an absolutely amazing job here. Um, so I've been in, uh, having a, a lot of conversations this year already with Alex about how the, the resources we've created complement each other. and uh, while the UK Holocaust map helps us to uh, understand history, local histories that otherwise could have been unknown, unnoticed, undiscovered, what the library's resource helps to do is retrace journeys of refugees. And I think they're amazingly complementary, actually. And it's, it's been fabulous to see that unfold. But what we wanted with both of our resources, I think, is that they can act as springboards. We want to empower people to discover uh, more. And it's all about discovery. Um, and that means allowing people to, to set off in, in unexpected directions. I think that's, that's absolutely what we've, we've managed to achieve here. Um, and I just wanted to give an example from, I mean, the library uh, is one of the things that we featured on here. And actually it's, it's uh, I, I wanted, to, Alex, if we could go to the Wiener Library 1958 to 2010. I mean, I think some people on this call will know that the library had multiple locations. Um, but uh, one of the things that we wanted people to be able to discover was, uh, was the library's previous homes. And uh, we actually wandered up when we had a farewell party for the previous director, Ben Barker, the staff of the library all wandered to the previous home of the library. And uh, I think 
that one of the things that's nice about these maps is that is that it allows people not just to see the building but to understand the history behind it to, to see photos from the time um, and uh, one of the things that I did as a little ex sort of experiment thinking about the, the the pins on the map was to was to think about what would happen if if we continued that journey and I would just look for something that is just a short walk on from the library and what I discovered actually was I, I found something on on our on the library's refugee map. I might just post this link to you, Alex. I don't know if, if you're able to, mm. to open it. This is a um, this is something I discovered in it's in the pin for it is is in Paddington Basin, which is just again a short walk from from uh, all three uh, look, former locations of the library. And it tells this pin tells the story of Irene White who. Uh, I knew nothing about actually before sort of doing some exploring on the maps and uh, uh, what I found lovely about it is I, I, I sort of just stopped on this pin because I found the illustration intriguing and uh, it, it, the, the next thing I did after reading a little bit more about Irene White was to just I, I then went off the map and I googled her name and I discovered a lovely obituary of Irene in the Association of Jewish Refugees Journal and I discovered you know, she had come to Britain at the age of 19 in 1938. She went on to become a nurse at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington and served there as a nurse during the Blitz. Um, uh, and she was later an active member of the AJR. And there may even be people who knew Irene in this in this Zoom. Um, and uh, so then I, I decided to take the journey of discovery then to the next step. And I went down into the library's reading room and found the memoir that Irene wrote. And there's some lovely, beautiful pictures of Irene uh, in this book. And it, I suppose the reason I, I wanted to just illustrate that is that, you know, the, that's a bit like the journey of discovery that you can do if you're going through an archive box or if you're searching through the shelves on the library. It's kind of happenstance. You might stumble upon something and it might be something else that catches your eye when you're browsing around the map. Um, but it allows for that chance discovery and I'm hoping that there are a lot of people who will use the UK Holocaust map or the library's refugee map, who will, who will find something that just catches their eye, that, that sparks their interest. And it might lead them to pick up a book that they have never read before, or it might lead them uh, on a completely different journey of discovery. Um, but really, I, I just wanted to emphasize that we weren't about creating a walled garden. We wanted to empower people to, to go on their own journeys of discovery. So I'm hope, I'm very excited about the future for this resource. And I just want to say congratulations to the AJR for creating such a wonderful thing. Thank you so much, Toby. You, you use the phrase journey of discovery. I, I might've used the phrase rabbit hole, um, which is usually a thing that people complain about, you know, that the internet, you know, though I kept going down this rabbit hole and then it was three hours later and where did my day go? Um, in th this map, you'll you'll notice when you scroll around, visitors will notice that we, in almost every pin, we try to provide links, external links, to go somewhere else. So it's very much a a, an, a, a resource that's about signposting to other sites. And I'm sorry, but we are encouraging you to go down those rabbit holes to um, to, as you say, go on those journeys of discovery and and learn more. So so. Um, you know, once you do start uh, exploring it, it, it may, you may find yourself spending more time than you had bargained for. Um, our final speaker, certainly last but not least, uh, is Hannah Randall from the uh, Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association, the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center at the University of Huddersfield. They are an organization of many names and lots of great work um, who have also contributed some really interesting sites to this. And Hannah, you wanted to point out uh, one of them to us. So over to you to tell us about this one that I'll share. Hi, uh, thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, so Alex said, I'm Hannah, and I'm the producer of Learning and Events here in Huddersfield. Um, as well as the exhibition, we actually have um, an archive and collection with the history of over 80 Holocaust survivors who sailed in the North. So we will definitely be adding more pins at some point. Um, and we were very pleased to have been asked by Alex and the AJR to be part of this map. Being a centre in the North is important to both our identity, our mission and our history. So to be able to contribute to this project and highlight the importance of the North was a great honour. And we hope to tell global history through local stories and being part of this project helps us do that. 
So one of the places that I want to show you guys tonight is Keg and Textiles Limited. So the mill is located in Elland um, on the outskirts of Halifax in West Yorkshire. And it was founded by Joseph and Margaret Kagan. They'd met and got married in the Kaunas ghetto in Lithuania. And they survived the Holocaust by being hidden in the roof of a local factory. So after their liberation, they came to the UK as Joseph's family were already here. Um, they'd set up before the outbreak of war, so they decided to join them. Joseph's family had a textile business and to begin with, Joseph worked with them, uh, but working with family is not always easy, so he decided to start his own business. And that is where Kagan Textiles Limited was created. The company quickly grew after the invention of Ganex, a material that kept the wearer both warm and dry. And it was famously worn by the then Prime Minister Harold Wilson, also from Huddersfield, um, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, and even the Royal Corgis. So they also made the cushion covers and rugs for the coronation, which we can see in the picture here. Um, so Joseph Kagan is the gentleman in the glasses. Um, the business flourished and were the primary employer in the local community, and they employed over 1,000 from the local community. Being refugees themselves, they wanted to include other refugees within their employ. And this included their cousins Val and Ibby Ginsberg, both survivors of the concentration camps. And you can see Val is the other gentleman on the left hand side there. So in 1970, Joseph was knighted for his services to industry. And then later in 1976, became a life peer, becoming Baron Kagan of Elland in the county of West Yorkshire. After a fall from grace, he had to forfeit his knighthood, but he remained a peer and actively spoke on prison reform and other social issues. Margaret, Lady Kagan, worked tirelessly in the community to improve community relations alongside bringing up their three children. Although the mill was demolished in 2010, it remains key in the memory of the local community. I myself remember driving past with my parents when I was younger and seeing this huge mill and often wondering what was happening inside. So when I learned the story of Margaret and Joseph, when I started working at the exhibition, I was astounded that their story wasn't known. It wasn't known by many in the community and indeed the country at large. So I hope their, their place on this map will help correct this because above all, this story shows the impact, importance and contribution that refugees can make to society. We hope to add more, as I said, because we want to make sure the North is represented within Holocaust memory. So thank you, Alex, for including us. Thank you, Hannah. That, that's fascinating. And um, not, not at all a paid advert for, uh, for Ganex, but it may as well have been. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, and it, you know, it just, again, just goes to, to show that there are so many uh, unique untold stories, you know, and I think one of the things when we talk about Britain's connection to, to the Holocaust, a lot of it is, um, you know, our post-war stories about the contributions that people who came here as survivors or refugees made to this country and that, you know, the, the story of the Holocaust does not end with the liberation of camps, um, that it's something that's very much been a part of, you know, this country's history for, you know, the, the second half of the 20th century and beyond. So thank you for highlighting that. That was, that was fantastic. Um, okay. That thank you to all of all of our speakers. We have a few minutes. I, I did want to keep this meeting to to an hour. We've got five minutes left. I do want to answer some questions. Uh, if people you know need to to leave um, at five o'clock, that's totally understandable. But um, the 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 most common question that people have been asking is is about how do you how do you contribute on a technical level? It's as simple as just getting in touch with us at the AJR. Um, we set up a, a a email account map at ajr.org. UK. It's posted throughout the site so you can get in touch with us. If there are records that you would like to con contribute to the map, please do get in touch. If there's information about one of the records that we, the pins that we already have on the map that you feel like you could um, 
you could uh, enhance. For example, um, you have some documents that we don't have and we could upload that, that would be great. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I, I know that there's a few people here from uh, the Anne Frank Trust and I see um, Jillian, the, uh, the founder of Anne Frank Trust UK is, is here with us today as well. There are Anne Frank trees all across the country that we, um, we've we highlighted on the map thanks to their contribution to it. Unfortunately, for those <laughs> the map, we don't always know the precise location of every Anne Frank tree. We know sort of what park it's in or something like that. And so, um, and so if you know that it's, you know, where that tree is much more precisely located, tell us and we can, we can move the pin to be more exact, those sorts of things. But then people also ask questions about um, well, what, what qualifies for the map. And as Mike said at the outset, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky one. What, what uh, qualifies as a, as a Holocaust site? Um, or a site of relevance to British responses to Nazism, to, um, to Jewish refugees, to survivors, to rescuers. Um, it's, it's not easy. If you have questions, you know, I think it's more of a conversation than, than a, a strict rule, but do get in touch with us because, you know, as several of our speakers um, have stressed, this is, this is really the beginning of the project. This is the, you know, the launch of an ongoing um, process of populating the map and not, you know, a sort of, you know, a one-time uh, um, resource that we put out into the world and it's, it's done. Um, just looking at other questions here. Um, gosh, there are a lot of them. A lot of people just saying that they're looking forward to using it, which I'm very pleased to see. So thank you for everyone who's saying that. Um, well, okay. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, Hannah, Monica Bone uh, Dutchen, who you might know, wants to know if you were aware that the Kagan's daughter, Jenny, is an artist, much of whose work engages with her parents' wartime story. Is that something that, that you guys have? Yes, so um, Jenny helped create the exhibition. She did a lot of the artwork, and she is also an Alberta of trustees, so we work really closely with her. Oh, okay. So, yes, you very much knew that. Um, okay. Honestly, there's there's a lot of suggestions of things that should go on the the map, um, which is uh, I I will I will download this chat and try to respond to all of those. Um, I do see um, Jillian, you have your hand up. I'm going to unmute you if you have a, a quick question or comment. Please do. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Alex, it's been just absolutely fantastic. And I think the ripples that you're going to send out to future generations with this is going to be a living, breathing project. And for me, it's so nostalgic, firstly, to see so many people who've attended today that um, I work closely with, including Lord Pickles, over the years. But uh, I was so surprised when Hannah started talking about Lord Kagan, because when I was a very young, centuries ago, design student in fashion, I went to stay with uh, Joseph Kagan in his very grand manor house, Barkisland Hall, um, to do my work experience at the Gannex factory and got to hear firsthand from him his Holocaust sort of story. And I, I seem to recall he escaped by swimming a river. So it was a very daring do story. And his wife, Margaret, was, was absolutely delightful. And also Irene White, when Toby started talking about Irene White, I remember her so well in the early days of the Anne Frank Trust. She was one of our volunteer guides. And I remember visiting in her in her home. She always had a lovely little knitted hat on and she was absolutely delightful. So it's been, you know, just to me, it's been more than little pins on a map. It's been real people and real memories. And that's what it's going to continue to be. Oh, that's, that is brilliant. Thank you so much, Julian. It's so nice to see you. It's been too long. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, excellent. Well, um, we, we've ticked over five o'clock. Um, if, if people uh, have other suggestions, please do get in touch with us. I, as I said, I've got loads of them in the chat here, but also you can contact us directly at map at ajr.org. UK. I, um, I encourage you all to please go and, uh, you know, explore the map and, and share it with others, you know, put it on social media, use it in your classrooms, whatever you are able to do. Um, we, uh, we, it, now that it's out in the world, we very much hope that it will be, it will be widely used. Just again, in case you couldn't uh, see it on the screen, it's ukholocaustmap.org.uk. And um, with that, we'll draw this to a close, wishing everyone uh, who celebrates a happy Christmas and a happy new year to all. We look forward to seeing you in the new year.
hopefully the next time we have one of these, it'll we'll be able to uh, see each other in person, but uh, that remains to be seen. But thank you all for joining us today and all the best. Thank you.